Today's program, The Threat from ISIS, Real or Imagined, promises plenty for us to think about. I'm going to read here from the introduction and the biography of our speaker, Nabil Khoury, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Middle East and North African Studies program at Northwestern University. Professor Khoury has served as a Foreign Service Officer with the State Department for 25 years before recently retiring with the rank of Minister Counselor. During his State Department career, he served as Director of the Near East South Asia Office of the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. That's from 2008 through 2012. He was Deputy Chief of Mission in Yemen from 2004 to 2007, Deputy Director of the Media Outreach Center in London from 2002 to 2004, and Consul General in Morocco from 1998 to 2002. In 2003, during the Iraq War, he served as Department Spokesperson at U.S. Central Command in Doha and in Baghdad. Dr. Khoury was also a Senior Fellow for Middle East and National Security at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs throughout most of his State Department career. Before his Foreign Service career, he held academic appointments in political science at the College St. Rose in Albany, New York, and at the University of Jordan in Amman. He's published many articles on issues of leadership and development in the Arab world and peer-reviewed academic journals. Currently, he has his own blog and writes from Chicago on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. His two most recent publications on the impact of the Arab uprising on the balance of power in the Middle East and on U.S. policy in Yemen appear in the Journal of Middle East Policy, the summers of 2013 and 14. It is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Nabil Khoury. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, I'm glad that part, I was wondering, you know, with the bio, I forgot what I had sent you, and um, that I was hoping that the College of St. Rose would be in there uh, somewhere, because actually that's where I started my academic uh, career seems like eons ago, but uh, lo and behold, uh, Frank Fitzgerald here is an old friend who used to uh, teach with me there, and apparently still does. He uh, uh, goes back and forth between here and uh, Albany. So I'm glad you mentioned St. Rose. It um, still has a very special place uh, in my heart, uh, having started me off. Um, and I'm glad you all uh, were a bit uh, late straggling in. Um, as I was totally lost for about 15, 20 minutes, and I was saying, oh, no, I'm holding up these people. Um, I started to uh, uh, call my GPS stupid until I realized that I had put in the right street address but the wrong city. <laughs> So I apologized profusely to my GPS, and I said, <laughs> nice GPS, nice GPS, forgive me, my mistake. Um, anyway, I'm uh, impressed that uh, so many of you have uh, showed up on such a day and on a Sunday. Um, shows your uh, dedication to come here on a day like this for a heartwarming discussion of ISIS. <laughs> um, I was thinking, you know, I, I'm teaching a course at Northwestern uh, right now, and I always begin the class with a 10, 15 minute discussion of whatever is hot in Middle East news. <clears throat> and I tell them, if we ever come in here and stare blankly at each other for 10, 15 minutes, not finding something hot and exciting in the Middle East, then I know the world has ended or something really <laughs> Um, grave has happened. Um, this past week, of course, Yemen has been the hot item in the news, replacing ISIS for a while. Um, but the and then I've had several um, interviews, radio and television, the uh, Arabic Al Jazeera, uh, hotly debating what's going on in Yemen. 
Luckily, however, these things are always interrelated. So if you talk about ISIS um, or Yemen or, or Syria or Iraq, you have three different ways of looking at things. You look, you have the short view where you zoom in. You have the mid-level mid view where you're looking at the region. And then you have the long view where you're looking at the big picture internationally. If you're like me, you lack focus on all th three levels of vision. <laughs> Uh, but let's try to uh, focus in a bit and then uh, zoom out on this uh, ISIS situation. ISIS as a group is a um, bunch of uh, people started out really uh, small, essentially graduates from Al-Qaeda and then graduates from Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was a separate uh, organization but very loyal to the mother organization. And then ISIS, which has changed names two, three times, ISIS, ISIL, or IS, the Islamic State uh, Organization. These people essentially are uh, preoccupied is not uh, a strong enough word. They're really uh, enchanted, totally absorbed, transformed. Uh, they're focused on seventh century uh, Middle East. They are um, uh, bent on refighting the original war over the caliphate of the seventh century. Who, uh, the, the question of who should succeed the prophet. They follow their scripture, the Quran and the Hadith uh, in this case, literally. And they, so they first want revenge against those whom they feel uh, derailed the um, ideal Islamic state. And for them, that would be Shia Muslims, first and foremost. They also want to recreate that state. It is, uh, when one talks about negotiations with enemies and so on, this particular bunch would, in my opinion, be impossible to talk to uh, because their frame of reference is totally 7th century. So unless you're interested uh, as a historian to only talk about the 7th century Islam and what happened, then you probably do fine over a cup of coffee with one of these guys. Nothing stronger than coffee, please. Uh, <laughs> you don't believe in anything uh, else. And I'm not sure they have coffee for that matter. Um, so the, um, the, their list of, of enemies then begins with Shia Muslims. Number two would be corrupt Sunni leaders. And in their view, all Sunni leaders currently are corrupt. Um, so they would believe in overthrowing these regimes to set up, begin building, uh, the ideal caliphate, the ideal Islamic uh, state. Uh, then in building this state, the first stage for them is terror. So terror, terrorism is not uh, an accident. It's not, uh, it's not purely emotional. It is a deliberate uh, tactic by which they intimidate uh, enemies and they uh, take over and eliminate anybody that would be an obstacle in their way. Uh, so what they're doing is, is uh, conscious, it's deliberate, it has uh, a purpose. Uh, perhaps they think that at some point in the future when their ideal state is established that they would no longer need it. But for the time being, they have no compunctions about using uh, any any uh, means of violence against one person or a group to intimidate the larger uh, group beyond. All right. Um, having said that, this um, you look at <clears throat> you look at Iraq, you look at Syria and Lebanon, and you look at Yemen. ISIS, in a way, uh, connects. There's a thread here. Uh, that connects uh, these countries and, uh, and the region. The, uh, <coughs> a 
if you go back uh, to the, uh, uh, you go up to the regional uh, level, at the regional level, you have essentially a balance of power, a struggle for power between Iran on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other. This uh, competition went on even when the Shah of Iran ruled Iran. But after the 79 revolution that brought the clerics to Iran, uh, it turned into a Sunni Shia competition because Iran is predominantly Shia Muslim and Saudi Arabia is the preeminent Sunni Wahhabi particular sect of Sunni Islam uh, in the region. They are the two big guys on the block. Uh, they compete for power. The, lately, the, since uh, 2011, since the, situ the Arab uprising and the situation in Syria uh, blew up, Iran has been using Shia militias, Shia militias that it created in Syria uh, after the uh, beginning of the civil war there. Shia militia, which it had participated in creating and has been funding and assisting and partnering with in Lebanon, Hezbollah. It uh, used Shia militias inside Iraq to go across border into Syria and help the Assad regime. And the Assad regime has been important to them, not necessarily religiously. The Alawites of Syria are not technically speaking Shia, but they're closer to Shia than to Sunni Islam. But primarily because Syria has been uh, an important middle ground uh, through which to send, <coughs> to send uh, fighters, weapons, and funds to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah in Lebanon is probably the most important organization for Iran. Uh, the uh, Iraq being a majority Shia and having a majority Shia government has been more or less allied with Iran, particularly under the previous prime minister, uh, Maliki. So, uh, and, and Maliki was uh, hated with a passion in Saudi Arabia. So from a Saudi perspective, Iran has been mobilizing Shia Islamic forces, whether uh, official or unofficial militias, in the region to overturn the region and ultimately overturn Saudi Arabia. That's how the Saudis see it. They hammer us, uh, they hammered us in the past. Whenever anybody talks to them officially, that's the first thing that uh, they talk about. That's their major preoccupation. Ironically, uh, if you follow uh, Bibi Netanyahu at all, you find that uh, he is very much singing the same tune as Saudi Arabia and um, is always harping on Iran as the biggest and most important danger uh, in the Middle East. So the, uh, the regional struggle goes on by proxy uh, mostly. Uh, the uh, Iranians rarely fight uh, Saudis directly. The Saudis haven't been fighting themselves at all, except that many of their citizens are filling the ranks of ISIS. And Saudi Arabia spends money to try to influence the situation and help Sunnis fight Shia, essentially. Uh, uh, but uh, essentially, these are proxy wars between the two. And um, given how Iraq has gone, uh, particularly since the departure of US troops, given how the fight in Syria uh, is going, and given the most recent development in Yemen, uh, we can safely say that Iran is winning, has the upper hand in that regional uh, struggle. Even though uh, Iran is fighting ISIS and trying to get ISIS defeated and has not succeeded in doing so, still overall in the region, uh, Iran uh, is getting the upper hand. What happened in, in Yemen recently is that you have this group called the Houthi group, and that's the name of a tribe that is the largest tribe in a sect called the Zaydi sect. Zaydi sect is an offshoot of Shia Islam. 
Until recently, I would say 2009, 2010, Iran didn't even pay any attention to the Houthis, not consider, uh, considering them Shia properly, and not really caring that much about Yemen. Uh, the Houthis had been fighting a, um, a war. So um, they had been fighting a war. Uh, they tend to be in the northern part of Yemen. And they've been fighting a war for six years from, well, more than that, from 2004 to 2010. They've been fighting a war here against their own central government in Sana'a. Uh, uh, having no love lost between them and Saudi Arabia, in 2009, the Saudis uh, tried to help former President Saleh, who was fighting these guys, by allowing his troops to come up from behind, go into Saudi territory, circle around and go in to kind of encircle the Houthis and defeat them. He tried that, the Houthis who were really a ragtag army, barefoot uh, guys uh, jumping from rock to rock essentially in that very uh, rugged terrain up there. Uh, uh, they saw this happening so they attacked certain towns within uh, Saudi Arabia, inside uh, the Saudi border. The Saudis then use that as an excuse to bring their American equipment, F-16 and rockets and so on, and enter the fray, enter the war against the Houthis. Uh, didn't do them any good, by the way. The Houthis humiliated them so that they had to leave without accomplishing their goals. And by, uh, in the process, also soundly defeated the central army of uh, Yemen. When this happened, however, Iran's ears bricked up. And they said, oh, wait, what's this? You know, the Saudis are fighting again. They're actually sending their soldiers somewhere uh, after their token uh, uh, participation in the first Gulf War, 1991. Uh, so Iran got interested. And they said, well, the Houthis are uh, somewhat uh, Shia. They, uh, why, they started uh, sending some funds and some weapons. The Houthis didn't really need the weapons. They just needed the money. In Yemen, you can find any type of weapon in the world. I mean, if, essentially, it's if you don't see it, ask for it, and they'll get it for you. You just have to have the money. So uh, Iran was happy to start funding this group. In 2011, uh, after the uprising reached Yemen and succeeded in uh, toppling over uh, Saleh, the former president, um, there was an opportunity for the Houthis who had defeated the main army uh, and defeated some other tribes uh, in the north to uh, take over the whole uh, north of Yemen from here and uh, Hezbollah, allied with Iran, sent trainers to North Yemen to work with these guys. And uh, so they, they, uh, there was a, more or less a power vacuum in Sana'a, even though they elected a new president who has just been ousted, Hadi. Um, there more or less was confusion, division in the ranks of the military, which some of some units remained loyal to the former president. Some stayed with President Hadi, the new president, and some defected to the Houthi ranks. The Houthis took over everything in the north and surrounded Sana'a. But nobody thought that these guys would actually take the capital and, you know, let alone move further south to try to take the whole country. I had I, I wrote something in early September, three weeks before they took Sana'a. I said, you know, these guys are going to take Sana'a. Because I saw, in, in, on, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they have their own uh, TV station that nobody paid attention to before. But they were talking about tactics that immediately rang a bell with me because they, these tactics were used by Hezbollah in Lebanon to take over West Beirut in 2008 in a matter of hours. And it's a clever, common sense military tactic. But the fact that they mentioned it by name, I knew, and I knew that they had Hezbollah trainers. I said, clearly, this is the, the objective. Uh, so they took over Sana'a very quickly. 
And for a while, they left the president and the prime minister alone and, and went further south to try to, and, and east, because there's the oil producing section. Does, Yemen doesn't have that much oil, but it has, that's been the main source of income for the government. So they went east to take that region. They haven't fully taken it yet. And they went further south. And now they are facing stiff resistance. They had taken the north and Sana'a easily. They are facing stiff resistance from tribes in the Marib region oil producing from Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, which is the main, um, uh, what shall we say, extremist Sunni uh, organization in Yemen. Uh, and from southerners down here in Aden and around there uh, who have been thinking of seceding from Yemen anyway and do not wish to replace their Sana'a rulers with the Houthis. So now the Houthis are uh, beginning to, to uh, get themselves in a mess for overreaching. Up until recently, there had, the word ISIS had not been mentioned in Yemen. This past week, somebody said, yo, you know, we're an ISIS cell in, in Yemen. So, I mean, I think that's crazy. Uh, if I were the military advisor of ISIS, which of course I would never be, um, <laughs> That I would say, forget Yemen. I mean, why, why go uh, from here and here? You want to cross all this, this? First of all, South Iraq is very difficult for ISIS uh, because it's primarily Shia and uh, armed to the teeth. And then you have all this expanse of Saudi Arabia. To get into what? A quagmire here where... From the Islamist extremist side, AQAP is doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, they're the strongest branch of Al-Qaeda uh, outside of whatever Al-Qaeda is these days. And um, then you have the Houthis, who are really the strongest group in, in Yemen right now and highly motivated and good fighters. Uh, and then you have uh, tribes. Yemen has always been tribal and, and very fractious. They are very irreverent. They don't respect any central authority. Uh, Saleh was very skillful at sort of keeping them uh, under control by changing alliances and balancing people all the time. But for ISIS, this is going to be a very, strong, a very difficult place to take. Uh, but I think they just, they've been sending small groups across North Africa as well. So I think they're probably just laying the seeds for something later on, uh, if they become really uh, strong and well entrenched in Syria and Iraq. Um, so the, there you go. I mean, the, 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 the middle range picture is that regional struggle, which now continues all the way from uh, Yemen to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and beginning to affect uh, North Africa as well. If you look at the, the long view and you look at um, the West and the US, well, um, ISIS has proven much more serious than President Obama first thought uh, it was. Uh, there was a kind of dismissal of them when they first swept across uh, northern Iraq. They surprised everybody by growing, so starting from uh, 3,000, 4,000 fighters. They quickly grew to a standing army of 30, 35,000 is the latest estimate with lots of people, uh, Sunni tribes uh, around the, the border between Syria and Iraq who are allied with them and at least acquiesce in their taking over their uh, areas if they don't actually participate actively in uh, assisting them. So uh, is the ISIS threat uh, real or, or not real? In the areas where they are, it's very real. Their zone of comfort militarily is the Sunni uh, areas. So in, uh, in Syria, they have essentially the north uh, east. And in Iraq, they have the north west. So that region, that circle, um, is their zone of comfort because these are largely Sunni areas. And the Sunnis, uh, young frustrated Sunnis in, in those areas, um, have 
been drawn to ISIS uh, for reasons we can get into later, if you like. Um, and others have been willing to, because they were mistreated by their uh, governments uh, in Syria and in Iraq, they are willing to at least look the other way and say, to hell with the central government. Um, these guys want to come in, let them come in. Uh, so that's why between nobody attacking them there and being able to recruit there, they are uh, quite strong. And they, are, they treat quite viciously any minorities that are not Sunni, or certainly even any Sunni that dares to uh, follow the appeal of the central government or the US and try to fight them. Uh, beheading is, is, uh, comes easy. That's sort of the standard uh, solution for any misbehavior. But it just starts there and, and escalates in terms of how they treat their um, opposition. Now, they beyond that area, in those areas, the only way they can be removed is if the population uh, turns against them where they are. And if uh, ground forces can go in and defeat them. Uh, the, the U.S. solution thus far, or the U.S. action thus far, has been airstrikes. Airstrikes will not defeat them. It will maybe it hurt them, maybe limit their expansion, but it will not defeat them. Uh, the, the, um, uh, they have been limited somewhat in their outreach in that they haven't been able to expand beyond the Sunni areas into any Shia areas or into any Kurdish areas. There's this small town um, along the Syria-Turkey border right here that uh, Kobani, which is a Kurdish town. And the uh, 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 citizens, the inhabitants of that town, put up a valiant uh, fight against ISIS. And then some of their fellow Kurds from Iraq came over to help them. Without, uh, with, with some airstrikes uh, from the US and the alliance with the US, limiting the attack capability of ISIS. But no troops on the ground, the Turks uh, did not intervene. But the Kurds on their own have been able to push out ISIS. ISIS is still around the edges of that town, but has not been able to occupy it. Uh, in Iraq, they tried to go into Kurdish areas and again were repelled. So there are limits to where their power can be. Um, Sunni areas in Syria and Iraq, yes, they're quite tough there. But given their primitive concept of governance, I don't think they stand a good chance of building a real state which could become a real threat to other states in the area. The threat from them in the region is their uh, ability to rob and steal and um, defeat local armed forces uh, here and there. Uh, and essentially be a, a big nuisance and particularly bad for minorities of any other religion or any other uh, sect. Uh, certainly, uh, we're talking here about belief and non-belief. Uh, don't, don't say you're an atheist uh, anywhere in, <laughs> in ISIS uh, control. There was recently, uh, I mean, it's funny in a macabre kind of way, they beheaded a, um, a Syrian in one of the towns that they control. And in the American media, it said because he cursed God. And I had to chuckle because uh, there is the Lebanese in particular, but some of the Syrians also, are very um, irreverent. And they, they use cuss words a lot, and a big variety of cuss words. And one of them, and they don't really mean them literally. When you read them literally, they're horrible, some of them. You say, oh my god, you really said that? Uh, but they don't mean them literally. It's just an expression. So uh, when you, sometimes, one of them is to curse somebody's god, you say, god damn, you're god, I, like that. I missed you, essentially. <laughs> so it's a, an expression. You're telling someone you missed them. You haven't seen them in a long time. In the process, you've cursed their god. <laughs> they, they don't take it uh, literally, and it's, it's said with a, with a laugh, with a chuckle. 
But these guys, ISIS, have no sense of humor. <laughs> so this guy must have said something like this to a friend of his, and they what? Well, he's cursing God off with his head. Uh, that's the kind of group they are. And uh, Lebanese and Syrians are full of humor, full of jokes, and, and they just you know, use words lightly. And you know, Christians and Muslims make fun of each other, and they curse each other, and it's no big deal. But with these guys, it's a very big deal. Uh, now, internationally, uh, can a, a group like that, as nasty as they are, can they threaten the U.S. and Europe? The short answer is no. I mean, they're not going to invade. They're not going to take over all of Syria or all of Iraq, let alone Europe and the U.S. They're not going to become a North Korea with nuclear capabilities. Uh, but they can send people over, as we saw in France, in acts of terrorism, where two or three individuals, and that's all it takes, to go someplace and plant a bomb or assassinate someone. Uh, so we've seen them do it in, in Europe. And I'm really doubtful whether it was actually ISIS that organized the uh, Charlie Hebdo thing. I think these are locals who are inspired by ISIS. And sometimes all it takes for something like that is a message on the internet. Why don't you do something about these guys? And that's all you need to say. And these guys are already motivated. The weapons are available. They go do it. Um, they can do something similar in the US. Um, here, I mean, we've been more careful from official and non-official levels not to repeat the provocative stuff that uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, engaged in. And uh, the attitude in the US is different. I mean, the, the Muslims of Europe are treated differently from the way Muslim Americans uh, are treated. Uh, so these are factors against something like that happening in the US. But I wouldn't put it past them. I think acts of terrorism are perfectly within their range. But in the end of the day, acts of terrorism like that are crimes. What happened in Paris, as horrible as it is, it was a crime. Uh, sometimes you have criminals motivated by all sorts of reasons. They're just crazy, or you know, their girlfriend uh, left them, or whatever. Uh, they were fired from their job, so they go and plant a bomb in the company where they work. Uh, this happens to be uh, Islamic religious extremism at work behind it. But in the end of the day, uh, in the overall scale of things, these are not strategic threats. They're nasty, they're hurtful, they're certainly bad for the people who become victims of them. But when you think strategically, uh, it's not a strategic threat. Now, in the Middle East itself, they will be able to, if they continue uh, growing and strengthening themselves, they will be able to hit, and certainly they've been hitting and robbing banks, they kidnap people for, and hold them hostage to get money, as uh, the case with the two Japanese uh, this week. Uh, that's how they uh, raise their funds. Um, so the, uh, American interests in the Middle East can certainly be hit by these guys as they become more and more confident and more and more in control of the areas that they control. So American banks, companies, uh, maybe businessmen traveling if they don't watch where they're going, uh, can be hit by ISIS. Uh, beyond that is American bases. So we don't uh, think about it that much, but there's a huge CENTCOM base uh, in Qatar, in, uh, just uh, on the outskirts of Doha. Um, this is where Central Command's main headquarters are. The U.S. Navy is based in Bahrain. The U.S. Air Force is based in Kuwait. U.S. ships are in the, in the Gulf and in the Red Sea. Uh, all of those are potential targets. Now, you say, well, why the hell are we there in the first place? So, well, <laughs> that's, another, that's another discussion altogether. The fact is the U.S. is a big power, is a superpower. It has interests. It has people. It has... Uh, ships and, and navy and so on. Um, if the US wants to keep them there, then ISIS is a big issue. To 
to deal with, as we know from previous things like the coal incident in Yemen in 2000, and that a ship as big and mighty as it looks can be attacked you know, if, if some small boat makes its way to it in the right way. Um, the, this is why the U.S. has been, uh, after not wishing to do anything about <clears throat> Bashar al-Assad butchering his people, more than 250,000 killed so far, uh, all of a sudden the U.S. wants to do something about ISIS, which my opinion in the overall scale of things is less dangerous than the Assad regime in Syria. And that's what Turkey has been trying to tell the U.S., but the U.S. is not listening. Uh, be that as it may, the U.S. is quite moved by this threat and focused on trying to eliminate it. The current strategy will not work. Uh, it's the locals that have to do it. I, my prediction for 2015 is that ISIS will be limited and shrunk a bit by the combination of Kurdish, uh, Shia, and Iraqi special forces who are being trained, again, by the U.S. Um, they will succeed because they're on the ground, and I would think they will push back ISIS. ISIS will not be finished in Iraq by the end of 2015, but they will have more or less been uh, brought back down to size, as it were. In Syria, th this strategy is not even going to achieve that. I think in Syria, ISIS will get stronger. And Syria is a big mess, and unless somebody has a good vision with the will and force to implement it, to end that conflict in Syria, then as long as it's messy and chaotic, ISIS will become stronger in Syria. So there you go, my uh, looking at the crystal ball and... Uh, I hope that explains the whole bloody mess here. <laughs>Thanks so much for a, a very interesting talk. I'm over here to your left. Thanks. Um, so my map, my seventh century map memory is pretty limited, um, and I'd be just curious if you can go back to that point in, that you're talking about recreating. They want to recreate the point in time, the seventh century Islam. What would that map? What's the aspiration of that map? What would it look like? And and how does that compare to where they are right now as a state? And for me, I would think of a state as population geography and sort of GDP. And if you could help me understand where they are right now with geography, people, and GDP, and what that would look like if they got to their aspirational map. GDP, huh? Now you're talking economics. I, <laughs> um, I have the same uh, luck with, uh, with these things like I have with my GPS, so. <laughs> All right. Um, that, I mean, it's a good question because, in fact, these guys are not only mentally based in the seventh century, but they are refighting these wars exactly in the places where they were fought in the seventh century. So, the, um, when the, the prophet uh, Muhammad was, of course, from here, Mecca and Medina, and then uh, when uh, he started expanding and in people started converting to Islam. Uh, he went uh, north into the Levant and east and west, uh, as well as south. So uh, the caliphate, the, the main struggle uh, was right after the prophet died, um, is a question of his uh, son-in-law, Ali, uh, who was married to his daughter, um, and uh, others outside the family. And uh, the, uh, the caliphate, when it was established, uh, so Ali uh, lost uh, the first fight, and, but he essentially became the third caliph. The caliph is the successor. So he became the third successor to the prophet. He did make it to that number one uh, spot, but he lost the first fight, which was uh, several wars, and his followers became known as the Shiites. So until today, 
those, uh, the Shia are the followers of Ali. And there are some other distinctions, but the, the distinction between Shia and Sunni is essentially historical. Uh, there's not that much in, in their belief or they read the same Quran, etc. but there's some historical problems here and there. Now, the first caliphate was established in uh, Iraq. And uh, so uh, right in here, the uh, Najaf and Karbala are two of the holiest cities for Shia Muslims, and they're in Iraq. Uh, the third one is Qom in Iran. And uh, the, the fact that uh, ISIS, when it was, it was formed by people who escaped from Iraq to Syria, but when the American troops left, they got themselves together, rebranded themselves as ISIS, and went back to Iraq, the most important thing for them being taking over the places where Ali in the seventh century originally lost out. And um, uh, now, between the caliphate moved, the Abbasids had it in, in Iraq, and the uh, Umayyads had it in Damascus. And at one point, the, uh, the Umayyad uh, dynasty or the Umayyad caliphate in uh, Syria had the Iraqi who had more followers of Ali and Shia here rebel against them. And so if you go back, there's, there's a wonderful piece of uh, literature uh, uh, when the Iraqis rebelled and the Umayyads in Damascus sent this uh, general uh, to uh, subdue them. Uh, his name was Hajjaj bin Yusuf, and he, he, they called for a town meeting, and he comes up at a podium like this, and he stands there staring at everybody. For about 10, 15 minutes, he says nothing, just stares. And people are beginning to get restless, so then he removes his headgear, and he says, I am Hajjaj bin Yusuf, and you know, when I remove my headgear, you will recognize me. And he, said, and he, 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 said, he starts by saying, O oh people of Iraq, you, you, you masters of sedition and deception. And he, and he goes on from there. I mean, that's the most polite thing he says about them in the speech. And he, he, uh, he says, uh, as I look uh, at you, I see beards trickling with blood. I see, you know, those of you who dare oppose the Khalifa, I will do such and such to them. And th this piece is in literature because of the um, eloquence of the speech. You know, it's, it's full of these really nasty threats, but at the same time, it's said in beautiful, elegant Arabic. <laughs> uh, and it, I, if I were directing the curricula anywhere in the Arab world, I would put it in history because the history of this it's very interesting because this is what's happening now. So that's you know a long answer to your question that uh, this is taking place there. Now, uh, Syria, the, the main value there is strategic. Iraq, of course, uh, lots of oil. Also strategic location. Uh, so if ISIS takes over both countries, it will be both rich and powerful. But I don't think they will be able to take over both countries. Not Thank in you. Whole anyway. yeah. All right, uh, there, there's an old um, observation uh, going on for many years that if you look at the length of the religions of Christianity and Islam, Islam is about 1,400 years old. And if you compare that to when Christianity was 1,400 years old, you had the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. And I'm wondering to what extent you agree with, the, where you, with you think that observation is illustrative? And if so, why? If you think it um, would lead one to the wrong direction, if you could tell me why. And as a subsequent qu second question, if you don't mind, why do you think, uh, it, what was Erdogan's argument to saying that Assad was worse than ISIS? Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually, I mean, I you know, usually bring that up uh, when I'm talking to my students, you know, they, that this, you have to look at this as the Middle East's uh, uh, Middle Ages, essentially. The Middle East is going through what Europe went through uh, in the f for 1500s and early 1600s. The, this is the time for 
religious extremism and revolutionary uh, turmoil. Uh, you know, just as in, in Europe they were overthrowing monarchies and going through revolutions and uh, dictatorships and this and that before it took, you know, 300 years before something began to emerge that resembles what we have today in, in Europe. Uh, the Middle East never went through that uh, for lots of reasons. The Ottoman Empire clamped down on everything. And uh, so it's in after the World War I that the Middle East begins to have independent states and monarchies. And then it takes time before people start feeling confident enough to challenge their monarchy. And religious uh, extremists who had been suppressed also emerge. And right now is a religious era. This is the era in the Middle East of religious extremism. Uh, the secular, liberal-minded people uh, <clears throat> who had done a marvelous job in the Arab uprising in 2011 in several countries, not all over the region, but they are a small minority. So when they succeeded, like in Yemen, in toppling uh, the regime, they essentially unleashed tribal forces, religious extremist forces, militias of various kinds, foreign intervention. So, and then they, when, when discussions, national dialogues took place about the future uh, of the countries, they didn't even have a seat at the table in many cases, except in Tunisia. But Tunisia is the only successful example so far of, yes, Muslims and Arabs can have a democracy, and, you know, knock on wood, so far, uh, they've moved gradually, step by step, and are uh, on their way to building a democracy where Islamists and secularists are being able to agree on, on something. Uh, but absolutely, I mean, the, uh, I don't know if any of you, uh, I, I tell the kids in, in class at the school, uh, they're more likely to have watched the Borgias, you know, that series of... I mean, the kind of religious extremism, the corruption in the Catholic Church, uh, the Vatican, uh, the horrible things that the Vatican did, um, it, what ISIS is doing now pales in comparison. So uh, it took the Europeans 300 years to emerge from that. It took a revolution within the Church, and it took a, a revolution... Um, in civil terms and a reformation <clears throat> before uh, things quieted down. Don't think the Middle East is going to take 300 years. But uh, given that this is the 21st century and all the communication technology in the world is open and all that, uh, but I think it will take 30, 40 years before these things subside. But, 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 you know, thank you for raising the point. Absolutely. Now, and that, huh? No, no. no. Another question. Uh, what can we do right now? We are scared stiff ISIS will attack us in some way if they were successful in France. Uh, should the United States government get involved? If they get involved, what should they do? They are our protection. I hate to see war, but what else can we do? Well, I mean, I think uh, the first thing is don't panic. <laughs> uh, I, I think this too shall pass. You know, right now it looks uh, bad, and in the Middle East itself it will be bad for, for several years to come. Um, but like I said, this is not a strategic threat to either the U.S. or to Europe. Uh, but it is a uh, it is a nasty uh, inconvenience. It it will hurt here and there. I think the just as in Europe, you you have to be careful not to overreact. And things like incidents like what happened in Europe unleash uh, right wing racism, uh, jingoism, whatever you ism you want to put on it. But people start saying, I had somebody, a Brazilian journalist, who had interviewed me once before for her newspaper, call after the, the Charlie Hebdo thing happened and said, why, why don't they just throw all these Muslims out of Europe? They, they're clearly not, not integrated. They don't like being there. I said, whoa, I, I can't believe you're asking me this question. I mean, 
You, in France alone, there are roughly three, uh, three million uh, Muslims. You're going to blame all of them because of the actions of three individuals who did this crime? Throw them all out? Um, but there are some right-wing voices in the U.S. that chimed in and said the same thing. Throw the bums out. Uh, but the thing is that you... I, I, have, I have neighbors sometimes that I talk to who you know, condone what happened in Guantanamo and say, you know, these people are animals. They deserve to be tortured. I say, you don't do this to animals. I mean, if you had a dog misbehaving, do you torture it? I mean, why do you think you can torture these people? Uh, again, so you have to be careful. I mean, sometimes these things unleash feelings where you least expect to find them. And you got to calm down and say... Tighten your security, be careful, you know, watch out. Uh, there are, and, and there are plenty, there are so many security measures that have been taken since 9-11, here and in Europe, that have been excessive. And you have to balance privacy with the right of the government to snoop on, on its own citizens. Uh, security, how much security do you want versus democracy? All kinds of atrocities and, and dictatorships have been uh, justified by, uh, in the name of security and, and stability. Uh, if you sacrifice democracy for uh, security, you end up getting neither, as I think the Egyptian uh, military rulers are finding out right now, because that's what they've done. Question? Another question? Um, I'm curious to know... It's going to be a tough one. Watch out. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what your opinion is about the extent to which the U.S. has been a driver behind these conflicts in the Middle East. Uh, what has the role been of the United States? And I know that's a giant question. Uh, but to what extent has, the, has, has this been aggravating the, the conflicts that are already there or even creating the conflicts that are even right. there. Uh, well, there are certainly, uh, and, and you know, by the way, when I talk on Al Jazeera and uh, debate people on uh, some of the uh, pan-Arab uh, TV stations and so on, I get bombarded by questions like that. There are the Yemenis I was debating with yesterday uh, convinced that the U.S. is in cahoots with the Houthi movement in Yemen because the Houthis fight uh, Al-Qaeda, AQAP. Uh, so their logic is, well, of course, the U.S. wants these guys to fight uh, Al-Qaeda. There are things happening in the region that are totally independent of the U.S. Uh, two important phenomena. One is ISIS, which is part of Islamic extremism uh, in the Middle East. <coughs> The, the U.S., even U.S. and Saudi Arabia, in using the Afghan Mujahideen uh, against the Soviets, uh, certainly fueled uh, a group of, of jihadis that were going to Afghanistan anyway. But they fueled them and, and gave them funds and weapons because that was the Cold War. And, you know, uh, these may be bastards, but they're our bastards kind of logic prevailed, and therefore uh, help was given to bad people. You're quite familiar with the uh, dictators of Latin America who were for years supported and funded uh, by the U.S. Uh, certainly, but the U.S. did not create Islamic fundamentalism and extremism. This is something internal to the region. As I was saying earlier, these, the guys in ISIS are not thinking U.S. and are not thinking U.S. policies of support to Israel and all that. They are thinking 7th century. They're, when they commemorate, there's Ashura, is the Shia uh, annual commemoration of the death of uh, Hassan and Hussein, the children of Ali who died in battles in the 7th century. When they commemorate that, you should see them. They, they flagellate themselves, they cry, they weep, as if they are at a funeral of someone who died this morning. That has, the U.S. doesn't enter into that. 
that these guys are filled with these images and uh, blaming people locally around them for them. And they are filled with the failure of Arab regimes, monarchs and uh, military dictatorships. The, the failure of these regimes to uh, uh, create modern successful states in the region. And so uh, where do they turn? They've tried Arab nationalism and socialism, that failed them. They've tried monarchies and capitalism and pro-West, that failed them. So they turn to Islam. They turn to images of the past, which they think in their minds was an ideal time. Wasn't necessarily. But, so these are all internal reasons, and this is the time for Islamic, Islam, Islamic politics, if you wish, uh, to try its hand at doing something in the region. Unfortunately, it's, it's a very nasty hand. Uh, but the other thing that the U.S. had nothing to do with is the Arab uprising, which for me and, and people like us is a more hopeful sign where young people using Internet and Facebook and so on <clears throat> communicated across state lines in the Middle East and essentially said, we don't want these bums in, in power anymore. We want to create modern, secular democracies. Uh, and uh, this phenomenon, again, when I, I, and I followed it closely, the demonstrations, the signs that were carried, the word the US did not enter into it, the word Israel did not enter into it, that wasn't on their minds. What was on their minds was the nasty rulers they have, and they want to get rid of them. Uh, and many of these young people are very idealistic and, and uh, yes, many have Western education, but not all of them. Uh, and many are using Western tools of communication, internet, Facebook, etc. But in the end, this is something that they feel based on their circumstances. Now, did the U.S. aggravate some of these things? Certainly. Uh, the U.S. popularity in the Middle East right now is in, at an all-time low. In some countries, it's down to like 3% favorable rate, 10%, uh, 15%. So even the regimes that owe their life, their life originally and their livelihood to the U.S. and to U.S. support no longer like the U.S. because they, they feel the U.S. has abandoned them. Uh, in Egypt, the, the three main power blocks, the, the military and old regime elements, and the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood Party, which is a moderate Islamist party, which was fine by me that they won the election and were going to rule legitimately, except the military didn't allow them, and the young secular youth. These three groups, each one thinks the U.S. is with the other. So... We've, if, if, you know, we've been successful in meddling, then we've been successful in confusing everybody. <laughs> They're all convinced that so the military that was for years supported by the U.S. doesn't trust the U.S. right now. They feel we supported the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood, and they say, well, hello, you know, these guys were elected legitimately in free and fair elections. No, it doesn't matter. They're terrorists. The Muslim Brotherhood is sure that we help the military throw them out of power and take over. And the young secular youth is saying the U.S. is meddling with everybody and they don't trust us and they don't want our help, although this is the group that we should be helping and working with. Uh, so uh, the U.S. support for, uh, for Israel has for years, of course, uh, been provocative um, and a lot of anger in the Middle East against the U.S. for doing that. Because every time Israel bombs some places or kills somebody, the U.S. is directly blamed for it. The U.S. has tried for years to bring peace between Palestinians and Israelis, but uh, miserably failed every time. But it's not for lack of trying. I think there are problems inherent in the mediative role that we've been playing. But uh, nevertheless, I think the attempts to bring peace were genuine, but they failed. So. Uh, U.S. support for dictators during the Cold War, U.S. support for Israel throughout, U.S. frustration via the use of the veto uh, of Palestinian aspirations for independence and statehood, all these are factors 
And these Islamist crazies uh, have that in, in the back of their minds. It's just that the, uh, the Israel and the U.S. are very low on their agenda right now. They're not interested in fighting either the U.S. or Israel. They want to consolidate their power among their fellow Muslims first. Then they'll worry about Israel and the U.S. after. All right, Mark, um, I'm going to look for unusual suspects here. <laughs> People that aren't every Sunday asking a question. Thank you. Um, I was just interested in um, kind of back, piggybacking on that question. A lot of the solutions usually for extremists like this is to have a country support the rebellious groups. Um, are there any countries, including the U.S., that are doing this now? And if so, is there a chance that that will once again blow up and then we'll have another group either like ISIS or will be just as violent after somebody supports them? By like rebellious them? groups, you mean ISIS? Well, no, by somebody countering ISIS. Oh, but okay. Yeah, this group. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, well, uh, Iran is supporting uh, Shia militias and the Iraqi army in fighting ISIS in Iraq. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been sending money to Sunni fighters in Syria and tribes in Iraq to try to turn them against ISIS. Jordan, after a lot of reluctance, is now, first of all, they've taken in uh, close to a million Syrian refugees. They're also providing grounds for training uh, Syrian and Iraqi uh, fighters against ISIS. Turkey is hosting over a million Syrian refugees and is hosting the secular political opposition of Syria against Assad. Uh, but they refuse to do more because they have a big disagreement with the U.S. over how they should do more. But I believe Turkey can play a very important role if it, um, if, if it was allowed to do it the way they want to do it. Um, uh, who else? Um, no, not really. I mean, that's, that's about it. I mean, I think right now our assistance to the secular Syrian opposition is token. It's really not serious. And it's because uh, the Obama administration doesn't care that much about the ci civil war in Syria, doesn't think it's any of our business to do anything about the removal of Assad, although Obama said from 2011 that Assad should step aside. He was surprised when he was bombarded with questions like, uh, what are you doing about it? And, oh, not me? No, no, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> he should step aside. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, now ISIS, because we see a threat to the U.S. from ISIS, so we're bombarding, and that's minimal. That's not real uh, involvement. Uh, Turkey gives some financial assistance to the secular Syrian opposition fighting ISIS. But th th that's about it. All right, one more unusual suspect for a last question. Let's see if I see someone I haven't seen here before. I haven't seen you here before. Thank you. Yeah, my question is, um, you know, with um, ISIS taking hostages from around the world, um, my question is, what, how do you feel the U.S. should handle that? What do you think about how other countries handle ransom paying or not ransom paying? And what, are, uh, what would you recommend for the U.S. and other countries in terms of handling that? My second part to that question is, um, how, what do you think about how, journal, you know, should that be portrayed in the press, the um, beheading of hostages? You know, should journalists be um, showing those tapes? Should they be broadcasting that? Should they not? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the news of it should certainly be uh, covered, uh, but I don't think uh, graphically. Uh, most media usually avoids uh, showing uh, things like that. And I think that's right. Uh, you know, there's something about uh, inundating people with, I mean, just like I feel about violence in video games and uh, violence in, in uh, regular movies that uh, kids watch, uh, you become somewhat, uh, uh, 
I don't know, uh, numbed to that. And um, uh, nothing else, like the, the case with the Japanese, apparently <clears throat> they received a uh, video or a photo of that. Uh, and that's horrible, I mean, for uh, families to see that uh, happening. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm for covering the news, saying that that happened, but I'm not for graphically dramatizing and showing people something becomes sensationalism and ugly uh, rather than informative. Now, um, you said, I'm sorry, what the original was? A hostage, yeah. I, you know, I know that different countries have different ways of looking at this. Um, and the U.S., you know, we don't deal with terrorists uh, principle. It may be a good principle. I mean, it has the logic behind it of not encouraging someone to take hostages and ask for money. But I don't think it should be, we should get up on our high horse and think that, you know, the Japanese or the French or others should do the same. Uh, if you scale it down to a normal situation where somebody, a local criminal, kidnaps your child and then calls and says, you know, give me that much money or I will kill your child. Um, different people here will have different answers, but I can tell you um, uh, the natural feeling of a parent is if I have it, give it to them and, and get me my child back. So. That will be my answer. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Corey. Um,